Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. If you're here on the East Coast, and I guess still good morning if you're over on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Jen DeRosa. I am the program coordinator for the Environmental Sciences and Policy Program uh, and the Energy Policy and Climate Program here at Johns Hopkins University. And welcome to part two of our Energy and Environmental Program speaker series for this year with our focus on water, energy, and food nexus. And our talk today is the Energy, Water, Food Nexus, International Security, Resource Stress, and Conflict. And I just want to say that rarely does one meet a person with such vast knowledge of people, places, conflicts, and solutions in the world as our speaker today. And it's exciting to listen to him speak. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker, Dr. Paul Sullivan. Paul is an internationally recognized expert on the political economy and economic development in the Middle East and North Africa. Northeast Asia, South Asia, and parts of the Americas. He's been advising senior leadership in government and the military on economic, energy, water, extremism, US Islamic, US Arab, and US Iran relations, the Middle East and North Africa, East Asia, South Asia, and other economic and security issues for decades. Paul is a, a full professor at the National Defense University where he has taught economics, industry analytics, courses about the energy industry and electives on economic warfare, Iran, Iraq, the Islamic world and natural resources and international security. As part of his work for the National Defense University, Paul has run field studies related to energy, environment and agribusiness and industries in a number of different places and countries, such as Tanzania, Egypt, Morocco, Spain, Mongolia, China, Chile, Greece, Turkey, Qatar, the list goes on and on. Paul is also an adjunct instructor for Johns Hopkins Global Security Studies Program, where he teaches energy and environmental security. And he's also a distinguished international fellow at the National Council for U for US-Arab relations. So please help me welcome Paul uh, by giving a digital clap in the chat box. And you'll also notice that we're gonna use our chat box today for asking questions during our Q&A. So please help me welcome him using the chat box and, uh, and using the chat box later for questions. So welcome, Paul. Well, thank you, Jen. Uh... For the students listening in and for others, if they're interested in this, being a professor, an advisor, counselor, whatever, can be a very interesting occupation. It can be even more interesting when you get to see things in the world and you connect them with the ideas that you're teaching and learning about. Really don't get a sense of energy until you visit the facilities and visit the pipelines and the nuclear stations. You really don't get a sense of food security until you visit farms and distribution areas. And you really don't get a sense of how important water is until you've visited one of the major reservoirs in lakes and rivers. It's a big world out there. Uh, I've been to all continents but Antarctica. I've been in a felucca on the Nile, a long boat on the Chao Praia in uh, Thailand. I've horsebacked across the steppes in Mongolia and in the desert near the pyramids. I, I was caught in a riot in Calcutta that was related to an India-Pakistan football game. And I've uh, hiked in Nepal and Chile, safari in Tanzania and Kenya, and much more. And this is the professor and advisor. I really don't think I would understand things in the way I do if I had not done these things. Travel truly is the best education but being at Johns Hopkins is obviously super. To the left of this slide, you will see Mount Kailash, which is a, a sacred mountain to the Hindus, the Jains, uh, the Bon, and the Buddhists. Uh, this is in uh, the Tibetan highlands and the plateau or near to it. It is also, as I'll show you, uh, near to or the source of many rivers that show importance to a huge amount of the population of Asia. 
And some people think that these rivers that start with the Tibetan Plateau uh, could be an important source of water, energy, and food when you follow through the tributaries and rivers connected for possibly two to three billion people. That was a B, billion. To the right is Lake Tana in Ethiopia. This is the source of the Blue Nile. And if you take a look at the dark green area here, this is a mountainous area, the highlands of Ethiopia. If you take a look where my cursor is going to Makele, this is the capital of Tigray. And you've probably been reading about the problems in Tigray. I would be very surprised if the problems in Tigray are not connected with Lake Tana and with the dam, which I'll be talking about later. I think from the last lecture, uh, and most of you probably know all of this, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. 97% plus of all the water in the world is actually salt water, but can be used and converted into fresh water through desal, which is energy intensive. Uh, fresh water, you have 2.5%. Most of that is glaciers or groundwater. We really don't know how much groundwater there is in the world. This is just a guess. And then we get to the fresh water, 1.2%, which is most of the water we think about. And then we think about ground ice and permafrost, think about how climate change is gonna change all of that. And then lakes, which we see in our lives, in our countries, and sometimes in our neighborhoods. And then we get to the rivers. So it's a tiny, tiny percentage, but a huge proportion of the population of the world survives off the waters coming from these rivers. And these rivers are recharged with precipitation, groundwater, and other ways. Now, the nexus, I'm gonna assume most of you are already familiar with, uh, water is connected with energy, meaning you need water for energy systems like uh, creating gasoline, uh, refineries, uh, running electricity plants. Actually, for the United States, uh, the largest use of water in our country is for cooling for fossil fuel and nuclear electricity stations. Uh, water needs energy for moving the water, for bringing it up hills, for putting it along pipelines, but also for cleaning and treating the water. And of course you need water for food. And that food well, cannot really survive without water. It actually can survive and grow without soil sometimes. Food security is connected in an interesting way. Most of you probably don't know about this, that a lot of biofuels are grown on land where you can grow food. So there's that difficult trade-off. Uh, energy is also used, oil and natural gas, for fertilizers, for pesticides, and also for moving and processing the food. So the interconnection is really deep, really complicated. Uh, we want to accelerate the access, meaning more and more people have access to energy, a secure and healthy food, secure and clean water. Uh, just as a data point out of Africa, somewhere between four and 5,000 people die every day because of dirty water. That could be cleaned up with certain energy systems. And even that could be cleaned up by solar systems, by putting it, the water in a glass bottle after filtration and then putting it on a tin hut roof so the UV rays can clean it up. You wanna be able to cre create more with less in a circular economy, you can do even more with that. You can use the waste to produce more things. Waste really is not waste if you can use it to produce other things or it becomes something in and of itself. And of course we want a sustainable environment and climate change to be put in check. Uh, water, energy, food for all, it's a good goal. You want it equitable and sustainable. These are the ultimates here. These are the things you, you aim at. Uh, the world is never perfect, but sometimes, please remember this, the perfect can be the enemy of the good. You can focus so much on getting everything perfect. And in the end, because of politics and human nature, you get a lot less than you could have had. Everything involves negotiation and discussion. Now, if you think of all the water that's wasted, when 30, 40% of the food in the world is wasted, 30 to 40% of our food that's produced, shipped, and sold is wasted. We could feed 2 billion people with that wasted food. Remember that as I go on in the, the lecture. 
Now, 60 to 68% of our fuel that we put into the energy system is also wasted. Many of you probably don't know that one. So think of all the water that's wasted when we have that. Think of all the food that's wasted, the energy, the water that's wasted. And then we have crops and energy technologies that are hugely wasteful of energy, consume massive amounts of it when they're unnecessary. The whole point of trying to figure out a more optimal way of dealing with an energy water food nexus is to improve things along the way. Look at this waste. You see this gray portion here? This is how much of the energy we put into the US energy system that we actually use. This is how much we throw out. We throw out because of heat loss, we throw out because of inefficient engines, inefficient braking systems, loss along power lines, uh, pumping uh, water and other liquids through uh, pipes that have 90 degree angles, which is nonsense, but that's the way people are taught. And we lose it in electricity generation, we lose it in industry, we lose it in transportation. Now remember folks, electricity generation and transportation are the biggest sources of greenhouse gases. So all this rejected energy from these sectors is actually rejected energy that is not useful that goes toward greenhouse gases and global warming. Now, how foolish is that? Now, this is water loss and kind of an extreme picture to stick in your minds. Uh, this is in Iceland when the ice and to some degree glaciers are melting on the mountains. I was once flying over Iceland at 2014 it was, and I saw this huge amount of water coming off a mountain. I contacted a colleague of mine in Saudi Arabia and said, I just found your water. But most of this water goes right into the ocean, right into the salt water and becomes undrinkable, unusable for uh, foods, for other agricultural goods. But we can capture this, quote, waste. Now, Malthus, as many of you are probably aware, said, uh, as population grows, we're going to hit a limit to our resources. And then the population will go down and life will get terrible. It's very negative, uh, pessimistic way of looking at things. But I just presented some of the major waste that happens in the world. The Malthusian trap is unnecessary if we manage things better, improve our technologies, connect resources in their policies in a nexus way instead of separate policies, and consider the distribution of resources in a more efficient and circular economy and sustainable way, meaning we use the waste to produce other things. However, many leaders will look at this uh, stress on resources and first think conflict rather than solution. The combination of climate change and demographic growth, population growth is going to exacerbate, this is from the EU, hydropolitical issues. And it will unless we get creative and we work together on these issues. Water conflicts are more likely to occur in areas that are already under water steps. That makes sense. But there's an area along the Mekong River that really didn't have water stress that now has water stress because the Chinese are building dams one after another and they're slowing down the water to the Mekong. Actually, they cut off a lake called Tonli Sap which is a major source of fishing and livelihood for a good proportion of the people of Cambodia. Uh, the most vulnerable areas, we'll talk about most of these, the Nile, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Indus, Tigris, Euphrates, and the Colorado River. I'm not gonna talk about Colorado. Let's see if we can get to the others. Now, these are the possibilities for hydropolitical interaction. High is the dark brown. Look at the Nile Basin. Look at the Tigris, Euphrates. Look along the Himalayas, the Brahmaputra, the Ganges, the Indus River. Look along the Tigris and Euphrates. They're just beginning to recognize what's happening along the Mekong. But in a few years, they're probably going to have to update this with a long set of brown lines going down the Salween, the Irrawaddy, and the Mekong rivers. Now, this shows you the countries that are under extremely high, high or high medium stress. The uh, Chinese are claiming high to medium stress. There are many places in China that are extremely high and high. Again, get more fidelity on this, you'll have a different map. Look at India, extremely high. Pakistan, extremely high. Afghanistan, high. 
Iran, extremely high. Egypt, high. And if the GERD dam is completed quickly and filled up very quickly, that will turn purple. But take a look at the Mekong River area in the Irrawaddy. This, I don't believe. This should all be red, yellow, or even purple because of the Chinese dams that are being built. This is a part of the world that will and is, frankly, controlling water sources and climate, not just for the people who live near it and the rivers that come off of it, but actually for the globe. Many people from this part of the world, including some of the religious scholars, think this is the center of the world. Well, in many ways, this can have a central aspect on the climate and the energy water food nexus and energy water food security for billions of people, not just contiguous to the rivers in the area that we're looking at. This is the Tibetan Plateau, which is called the Third Pole, because it's the third largest source of glacial water, of ice sheets, the bank of ice, that bank which we really need in the future. If this stuff just pours into the ocean or evaporates, things are going to get very complicated for many, many people. China controls the Tibetan Plateau. It controls Tibet. If anyone wants to know one of the main reasons why China took over Tibet, the answer to that is water, energy, and food security for China, and control of water and energy, not only for China, but for many of its neighbors. It's a rising superpower. It has muscular conf confidence, and it has a lot of leverage over the water tap of Asia. Take a look at the Tibetan Plateau. This is the area we're talking about, the picture I showed you with the desert up here. Yanong Sangpo becomes the Brahmaputra. This starts on or about near that mountain I showed you, Mount Kailash, the Sutlej, very important for Indus and water for India and Pakistan. The Indus, of course, is a massive source of water for Pakistan, which is the most highly irrigated country on the planet per capita. And then the Tibetan Plateau gives water to the Yangtze, to the Yellow River for a good part of China. Uh, the Chinese want to redirect and have already started redirecting the Brahmaputra here at the Big Bend, as it's called, on a huge uh, cement, rather concrete, uh, program to send that water toward eastern and central China. Irrawaddy, important for Myanmar. Again, it's being dammed up. Salween, being dammed up for Myanmar. The Mekong, dams up here, dams, dams, dams. There's so many dams you can hardly see where the water is sometimes. And a, a satellite photo. This is affecting the downstream, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and especially Vietnam at the Mekong Delta, which is a major source of rice for the region. And Thai rice comes from here, Cambodian fish, Laos food. All of this stuff relies on the Mekong and the irrigation canals coming from it, and also from the rains that are related to the waters of the Mekong, and also related to the monsoonal issues that bring the water into the Tibetan Plateau across the Himalaya. They're just fascinating. Think of this mountain right here. Think of how much water and how many populations are essentially controlled by the control of these rivers. Now, there's a small percentage of uh, the Mekong that coming out of the Tibetan Plateau that finally gets down here. So the Tibetan Plateau is maybe 15% of the water, but a lot of it's being shut off. That makes it far more complicated for the people downstream. But should, what I expect, the energy, water, food tensions being built up by having the hand on this water tap to head toward war, normally when you see water wars or food wars or energy wars, it's because there is almost evenness and power in the parties involved. There's no evenness here. China is a massive superpower with a massive army and navy and air force with a large number of nuclear weapons. And the Mekong Delta Associations are meekly talking back at the Chinese. 
this is a long time from when the Vietnamese took on the Chinese and actually beat them in a war in the 1970s. Now, the, the tensions can build in when India and Pakistan get into a tiff about water. And this has a lot to do with the Indus Basin. All of this stuff, by the way, is heading this way, except the stuff heading this way from the mountains in Kabul. This water needs to be shared. Both of these countries are growing countries with growing populations. And the tensions go back to the separation of these two countries in the 1940s. And those tensions are still there. And there are religious and cultural tensions and historical tensions. And now we add to that the water, energy, and food tensions. In order to have the hydro dams running properly, you need to have good flow of water. If one country cuts off the water to another, not only is the hydro dam less efficient in producing less, but irrigation is less possible. Food production is less possible. And the water won't be there for everyday things. Now, something interesting to focus in on for the Indus also, it goes right down here to Karachi and into the Arabian Sea. But I'm willing to guess that if you're here at the end of the Indus, you won't see a whole lot of water coming out much like in the Nile when it gets to the Mediterranean. It's almost like a trickle sometimes. Now this gives you a sense of the tensions involved, going back to administered by India, administered by Pakistan. If you're really interested in the Kashmir crisis, uh, read the history. Huge tensions, huge misunderstandings, uh, potentially solvable, but not easy. But an interesting thing about these tensions between Pakistan and India, is that they've had wars, three of them, I think three or four of them, during the time after the agreement was signed for the Indus Water Treaty partitioning. So the water is so important, they won't go to war for it. But who knows what's going to happen in the future. Now take a look at, over here. This is Karachi. This is the Indus Valley, the river. Notice the electricity up here in Kabul, Himalayas up here. Now look at all the non-electricity. If you're really interested in the energy, water, food connection, take a look at uh, NASA's uh, blue marble pictures of the world at night and see how much of the world does not have electricity, does not have lights. Then look into how much of the population does not have a secure and safe food supply or a secure and safe water supply. Populations are growing, resources are not. Although we do have a waste and we can grasp those resources back with the right policies and the right leaders. A lot of this stuff comes down to leadership. And unfortunately, in many parts of the world, leadership is lacking. I'm not pointing at this part of the world, this is a general station statement. Now, water availability in Pakistan and India reducing considerably since independence. That was a lot of water available to both in the 19, early 1950s, just after independence, just a few years after. And as they grew and as they irrigated and as industry grew and as population grew and as water, food and energy waste grew, and I'm not just pointing out Pakistan and India, we all do it, folks. Every single country on earth is massively wasteful when it comes to energy, water, and food. Now we get to Pakistan in 2025. They're beyond water insecurity. Water insecurity is about 1,000 cubic meters per year per person. They're below that. They're already below it now. India is heading in that direction. In some parts of India and some parts of Pakistan, they're well beyond water security. They're well beyond energy insecurity. The countries have tried to solve that with electrification programs and so forth. India has gone forward a lot of this to the electrification of the villages, but please do take a look at how they define electrification of the villages. It usually means that one or two or three houses are connected, not the entire village. That's what the index should be. Pakistan is a much poorer country in many ways, in energy use and in water use and in food availability, a much poorer country. And those tensions are difficult to deal with. 
And if you ever get to this part of the world, you might want to stop by this border area where they have the flags coming down every evening. It shows not only the aggressiveness of both sides, but also the potential for negotiation and better understanding. Sometimes our similarities keep us more apart than our differences. Now, a big worry on this is India, Pakistan with nuclear weapons. When it comes to the power of their military, uh, excuse me, my Pakistanis in the audience, you probably already know this, the Indian military is massively powerful. I think it's number three or four in the world. A lot of people, a lot of equipment, a lot of jets. Pakistan is building, but really doesn't have what India has. And that may be what's keeping back from an all out war. The last thing we need is an all out war between these two nuclear powers in a very delicate part of the world where energy, water, and food are so important and these rivers need maintaining and these hydro dams need maintaining. And one of the last things we want to happen is to have one of those hydro dams blown up. That according to the Geneva Conventions, a hydro dam is considered a weapon of mass destruction. Massive waves of water would come down if one of these was blown up. We don't need this. Shifting gears a bit. I'm sure there'll be questions on India and Pakistan, but let's move on from that. Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Now this is very tense, extremely tense. So I'm gonna be careful with my words. Um, I've been in this part of the world. I've lived in this part of the world for many years. Uh, by the way, the water moves from Lake Tana, which is the source of the Blue Nile, this way. It heads from south to north, just so you understand the tensions here. Egypt has very little rain. It relies on the Blue Nile, depending on the season and the floods usually in the summertime, July and August and so forth. And then 60, 65% of the water for Egypt comes through the Blue Nile. And then maybe another 25, even 30% comes in from the White Nile, depending. And then they have waters that they're using from here that's fossil water from many thousands of years ago. And this is really fascinating. The Egypt in the desert all the way across to Morocco, oh, you'll find some underground aquifers that could be 60 to 100,000 years old. It's fresh water. I've been to the Sea of Oasis where you can actually get a tap and it brings up hot water and you can make tea with it. But this is fossil water and it's not being replenished. How could that fossil water be there? If you ever get to Egypt, take a ride just to the southwest of Cairo to a place called Wadi al Etan near the Fayoum Oasis. You will see, and this is no kidding, I was there with my family, my wife and children, just a few years ago in the heat of the desert with a huge water bottle, of course. And we saw full whale skeletons in the middle of the Western desert. Climate change is real, folks. You can also see hippopotami and giraffe rock carvings in the Sahara Desert of Algeria. This has happened hundreds of times before in the history of the world and actually in the history of humanity. So if anyone says climate change is a joke and it's not real, show them those pictures. You, know, you can find it, just Google this. Wadi Al Tan, the Valley of the Whales. Now here we have major uh, dams, the Aswan High Dam in Egypt, and there are other dams, Meroe and elsewhere in Sudan. Sudan relies a lot on water from Ethiopia. The Sud wetlands is part of uh, the South Sudan. And when the South Sudan left, actually I was part of the uh, advising uh, the State Department and others on the South Sudan referendum. And I looked into water and oil issues. When South Sudan left the Arab League because it was part of Sudan, 25% of the water of the Arab League left with it. Isn't that something? This place has a massive amount of water. They leave Sudan. Sudan has desert, desert, desert. This is Darfur up here. By the way, Darfur, with all the troubles that happened there, NASA sent a satellite across uh, a few years ago and found that there are 
these underground water sources, excuse me, about 300 meters deep in some places, 60 meters in others, the size of New England. That war was unnecessary. You see, you don't know until you know. And you have to in, always assume that there's something there you don't know. And that there's a great deal of uncertainty into everything you're looking at, everything you're looking at. And always go ahead with a certain amount of humility, knowing maybe it's it, maybe something's there. For many years, people dismissed Saudi Arabia as having oil. And all what the king wanted in the early years was water. He could care less about oil. He didn't have an automobile until Churchill gave him one. Now, taking a look at this, much like the mountains and the plateau in Tibet, most of the water of the Blue Nile, Blue Nile comes from mountainous areas. We really need to take a deeper and smarter look at mountain areas in the world to understand their importance. Why does all this water happen in mountainous areas? Well, the warm, moist air comes up to the mountains. And as it goes up the mountainside, it cools, causing rain, much like in the Himalayas, much like in the Tibetan Plateau, some parts of it, but the plateau is often quite dry. Same thing in Iran, same thing in Chile. Throughout the world, it's mountains that often de define your energy, water, food complex. And we really need to look at this more. Here's the Aswan High Dam. Egypt is 90% dependent on the water. That, that's debatable and, it, and it's also uh, seasonal. They use most of their water for agriculture. That's the same as with India and Pakistan or about 80, sometimes 90% of countries use water for agriculture. In the Middle East and North Africa, some countries can use even larger percentages for water and this is a dry area. Part of the problem with that is people are growing rice in the desert. Going back to Malthus, if you changed your cropping patterns and the way you irrigate, you can cut that waste and actually have more food with less water. Whereas Egypt, 1960, that amount of water, 2019, they're well below shortage, they're in scarcity, and this is absolute water scarcity. The Egyptians are apoplectic about this and they have a good reason for it. It's not only this is happening, they need this water coming up from the south for irrigation, for hydro dams, for drinking water, for industry and so forth. But again, if you were to walk along these branches of the Nile, the Mediterranean Sea, you would see a trickle of water at the surface. What you're not seeing is a whole bunch of seawater encroaching in the underground aquifer and making it saline. Most of this coast is saline. It goes right into this territory and up into Syria. Uh, many of the coasts of the Middle East are saline. A huge proportion of the Tibetan Plateau is saline as well. The thing is we have saline water in the oceans with those charts that I showed you at the beginning, but also there's a lot of saline water in salt lakes in the world, some which are natural and some which are somewhat unnatural because of overuse of water, damming of the uh, rivers themselves, or the lack of negotiation between countries to make sure there's an equitable, fair, proper, sustainable, and survivable sharing of water, and that water for land, for food, and that water for energy. It's just the amount of conflict that could be reduced by simply being smart about this and focusing on what's going to happen in the future with climate change. And the Egyptians are very nervous about what's going to happen in climate change. I've met with many of their senior officials over the years on this, very worried. Very worried, particularly about the Delta area up here, which is the major source of their food. Most of their food comes from here. And it's not just salinification, it is not having enough water and also increasing temperatures. And I felt those increasing temperatures over the years. I first started getting involved in Egypt in the very early 1990s. And each year it gets more and more difficult to be in the desert in the north. And it's not because I'm getting older, I have a temperature gauge telling me that it is. 
Now, if the Ethiopians fill up this dam, then they're going to slow down the flow. Going up down the Blue Nile, there's Lake Tana, there's the dam. Uh, they're going to slow down the flow, which slows down the flow of going to Egypt. That slows the flow, the Aswan High Dam and other uh, hydroelectricity dams along it, including in Sudan, will also slow down. And, and if it's filled up too quickly, they will stop. However, Egypt is mostly electrified. Ethiopia is one of the lowest users of electricity on the planet. It has also had a great number of famines, and it's one of the poorest countries. Historically, the agreement for the Nile waters was between Egypt and Sudan, and everyone else wasn't even part of it. The British were there, the Egyptian and the Sudanese were not there. So in order to understand where to go with this, you really have to understand both perspectives. But another aspect of this is that Ethiopia could develop uh, its geothermal resources, which are massive and right near Addis Ababa, its wind resources through the valleys and in the mountains, and its solar resources. You add up the solar, the geothermal, and the wind, it's far greater than the nameplate capacity of the Gerd Dam, which is 6.5 gigawatts or 6,500 megawatts. But the actual average will be about 2.5 gigawatts because the 6.5 gigawatts, and this is important, will only be there when you have the floods. The Ethiopian armed forces are nowhere near the power of the Egyptian armed forces. This is something they have to think about. Uh, the Egyptians have to think about how do you get your armed forces there? Is it worth it to have a war? The last time the Egyptians were in a war with the Ethiopians, they went bankrupt, it was under one of the Kidui's. The cost of these wars would be a massive drain on an already challenged budget. And the people of Egypt are suffering under COVID and they don't need any more difficulties but it has taken hold of the public imagination in their hearts and their minds. They need this water. Without the Nile water, Egypt wouldn't be Egypt. That's the assumption. And as a matter of fact, that's pretty close to the truth. So there are tensions and understanding of both sides. What needs to be found is some middle ground before mistakes are made. This will give you a sense of the amount of water being put into the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, the GERD. If you haven't been to the Great Pyramids, I recommend you do. They're just an awesome sight in the middle of the desert. You can actually see them from many miles away on a clear day, which is another part of the problem with energy production in this part of the world and in India and in Pakistan and in China. The air issue, but I'm not getting into that now, but that's part of the nexus. 32,174 Great Pyramids would fill that reservoir. That's actually a little bit greater, actually a lot greater, than the water allocation to Egypt. This has to be done right. It has to be done right. And the speed in which the Ethiopian goals will be met, the Sudanese goals will be met, and the Egyptian goals will be met. But it's often not compatible, and the negotiations are often very testy. It would take someone of a an emotional genius as well as an intellectual genius to get into the middle of this and find a solution to this. And believe me, folks, a solution needs to be found. War is not the answer. I think we found that out in Iraq and Afghanistan and in Vietnam and so many other wars. This would be a disaster for both countries. Part of the solution for Egypt, better water management. They're looking into that deeply. Uh, President El-Sisi is doing that. He's building massive desalination plants where you can produce from the sea. This may be in the Gulf of Suez, this one. Uh, you desalinate the water, take the salt out, take the impurities out and send the water, uh, not only to households and industry, but also to farms. Uh, use less water, less water waste tighten up the pipes, use less water by changing cropping patterns. Of course, there's a cultural aspect to growing sugarcane near Luxor in Egypt. But frankly, folks, 
sugar beet can produce the same amount of sugar and actually could be profitable because it's also a food item. Again, this is very emotional stuff. I'm not saying this is the answer. I'm just recommending and advising options. Also change the energy systems. One of the biggest uses of water in any country that has a fossil fuel uh, generating station system is the cooling of those fossil fuel and nuclear generating systems. Solar panels use very little of it. Concentrated solar power uses a significant amount of it. Uh, nuclear uses a lot of it. Wind uses very little of it. Geothermal uses water from underground that you can reuse. Again, we have massive options here. The Ethiopians can use the geothermal, the wind, and so forth to produce the electricity they need for development. The Egyptians could do wind, solar, geothermal, and whatnot, including tidal and wave energy, and save the water. There are solutions here, folks. The question is getting to them. Uh, the Tigris-Euphrates I'm going to go through pretty quickly, but it's similar in many ways to the others. And I'm actually amazed I have that time because my talks are usually like a, a jazz concert. I'm really not sure uh, what note happens after the other note because it's just so fascinating. I, I could talk about this stuff forever, but I'm not going to do that because you guys don't have time and ladies don't have time. And if you have further questions, uh, you know where to reach me. Most of the water for Iraq and Syria comes from Turkey, again, in the mountains. Once more, the mountains. And Turkey has dammed these rivers up. They have the allocation of over 72% of the water of the Tigris and Euphrates. Their argument is, it rains where we are more than where they are. Therefore, the water is us. And historically, the water came from us. Therefore, it's ours. That's kind of the opposite argument uh, that the Egyptians are giving. And it's similar to the argument that the Chinese are giving. Some of Iraq's water goes to uh, the Kurdistan region and near Erbil through uh, rivers in Iran that are, the Iranians have dammed up. These are dams. Uh, Saddam used water as a weapon to try to starve and kill and dry out uh, the Shia in the south, in the swamps. He actually made a lake that he named after himself in order to do that. Now that's water war, that's food war, that's cultural war, it's inhuman, it's immoral, it's unethical. That's why when we look at these issues, you don't just look at the technical stuff and the economic stuff and the numbers and all that, you have to look at the morals and the ethics and the strategies and what things might be in the short, the medium and the long run. There you can see those Iranian dams and also the Iraqi dams. Uh, the waters of the Tigris and the Euphrates have been in decline since the 1980s, 30%. It will continue to decline. It's largely due to the upstream dam and irrigation projects in Turkey and in Syria. This is getting to Iraq because Iraq and Syria uh, share these waters. And also because of climate change, it's having real effects on the ground. Uh, the uh, Syrian revolution, many people believe, and I'm one of them, that this was in a way instigated by climate change and a drought in northeast Syria, northwest Iraq, and northwest Iran, which forced 160,000 Syrians off their now desertified land into the cities that were already just crackling with tensions. The climate change didn't cause the conflict. It enhanced the possibilities that it would happen and likely enhanced the severity of it. Turkey, Syria, and Iraq with population growth, agricultural growth, and industrial growth have less and less water per person. Look at poor Syria. Now who has the power here? Turkey. Can Syria go against Turkey? Absolutely not. Can Iraq go against Turkey? It's a split country. And the Kurdish-Turkish issue makes it even more complicated. Again, that relative power system. And I'm going to end it with this. This is the Mosul Dam in Iraq. Behind it is a massive reservoir that's used for irrigating about, oh, 20% of the farmlands in northern Iraq. 
uh, and this produces about 20% of the electricity in northern Iraq. These towers right here are concrete towers that continuously pour water into the base of this dam, because if they weren't continuously poured into the base of this dam, the, the dam would slip off of its foundation. Saddam Hussein built this in water-soluble land. ISIS took this over. And there was a fear that ISIS, Daesh, uh, actually uh, the Arab word that I more appropriately like for this is fahish. It's an obscenity. Uh, the word itself is not, a, it means they're obscene. Some people worry that they might blow it up, but they would lose the public if they did. They did use the Fallujah barrage as a water weapon against the Iraqis. So water can be used as a weapon. And if you're interested, go to the Pacific Institute and the fellow who runs that has a list of water conflicts that go back well into the fourth century BC. Thank you, Paul. So I have been tracking our questions that people have been, our viewers have been asking. Um, so I'm gonna give voice to our questions. Um, so thank you everyone for asking questions in the chat. And if you continue to have, I see there's questions in the Q and A, but please post your questions in the chat box, not the Q&A, so I don't have to look at two different places. I'd really appreciate that. Um, but I'll give voice to the questions that I have right now. Um, so for our, for our first question uh, for Paul, um, the question is, given the delicate geopolitical conditions in South Asia, but in the water stressed areas like in Africa, we see there's more transboundary water cooperation what can be a starting point for negotiations on transboundary water cooperation between the riparian states? And I'm not entirely sure if the question asker is referring to um, negotiations with respect to Southeast Asia or with respect to South Asia um, or to states here in the US, but I think they're leaning towards South Asia negotiations in that question. Well, if you're talking about South Asia, there's a lot of historical baggage here. I think, and excuse me, and oh, by the way, everything I've said is my opinion alone, does not represent that of Johns Hopkins or of the National Defense University. I think really when the next generation takes over these issues, there's more hope. Uh, there are a lot of people who hold on to their animosities and their anger dearly. And they're unwilling to be flexible with those issues. But a first start, I think, is to sit the parties down and talk quietly about all the issues involved. Explain what's going to happen in the future. Part of the problem with these treaties and negotiations is, well, they're only for the short run. Populations change, water use changes, agriculture changes, all kinds of things will change. Climate change will have a massive impact on South Asia. The time for the solutions are really now, but they, they have a great treaty that was developed in the 1960s that's worked well so far. And they've worked off of that treaty and have agreements now and then. But the populations on both sides in Pakistan and in India are very tense on this and the politicians are not helping. If anything, there should be some kind of education program from both governments to calm this situation down. And the United States should get involved in a quiet gentlemanly or ladylike manner and not impose ourselves on this situation. We have something to say. We were a part of the original uh, agreement along with the World Bank. China will have to have a say in this. Again, the world has become very tense because there are various extreme positions that are hardening. And we all know why some of those things are hardening. It has to do with sources of information or lack of information or willful ignorance or only focusing on those people who say what you wanna hear. Some of the problems I have, I'm a moderate in everything, including moderation. Some of the problems I have is when I say something in a group that have extreme or semi-extreme opinions, they all dislike me because I'm not agreeing with this person, I'm not agreeing with that person. 
But the solution to these issues is moderation and negotiation and figuring out a middle way. The perfect for anyone is the enemy of the good for all. Uh, next question, I hope I handled it. Thank you, Paul. Um, our next question is actually focused on desalination. So um, our viewer asked, in addition to desalination being energy intensive, the concentrate can be hard to dispose of. And this viewer has heard of one solution that they've read about in the past is disposing of the concentrate in ponds and utilizing the sun and salt gradients to create energy. In your travels, since you're so well-traveled, have you seen any such ponds during your travels? And what do you think of that as a potential energy source? No, I, I haven't seen them, but I have read about it as an energy source. Uh, salt uh, can conduct uh, water, uh, water conducts electricity, excuse me. Uh, the salt can help with that conduction. Uh, there are ways of using that salt if you clean it up uh, for foodstuffs. Uh, I've actually seen salt lakes in the north of Egypt and in India and Chile and many other in my travels where they actually take the salt, dry out the salt water and use it for food, for salting the food. Uh, if anyone uh, wants to see a very good example of that, uh, the salt march that uh, Mahatma Gandhi made to the sea to prove that the salt from the sea was for all Indians, not just for the British Raj. He put the salt water into sand uh, valleys, small ones, and let the sun evaporate it, and then put it into white paper bags and handed it out to all the people. This salt is not just to damage the local waters, but the Gulf waters, Gulf meaning uh, uh, between Iran and Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, and so forth, has become very saline because of the huge war use of uh, desalination because of the Saudis. Another risk of uh, relying so much on desalination is if your enemy knows where your plants are, they can hit them. And that can make your life very miserable. But conducting electricity can be made in very interesting ways. Uh, there's a way to conduct electricity by having uh, lemon water or orange water with a, a strip of copper and a strip of zinc in, in two cups. And you can produce enough electricity to run a small light. Uh, when I was at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, there was a fellow working on producing electricity for light through tomatoes because it's very acidic. Uh, the thing is, the only thing that's holding us back from these solutions that this person is talking about, well, one is it's going to be costly because the ways of making electricity now through natural gas and oil and solar are much less expensive than it would be to scale this up. But there are massive opportunities out there, and we really shouldn't dismiss them out of hand. Uh, a, a group in the government, which I hope gets better funded, is called ARPA-E, and it's uh, based on DARPA. ARPA-E is the Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy. And they fund the craziest, no, excuse me, the most pie in the sky, creative energy ideas that they think might work. And, but they're, they're making a, a big bet on this. Maybe a small per percentage will work, but also if one of them works, we've just figured out a huge solution to some big problems, like stabilizing the grid. Uh, many of you probably don't know that the electricity in your house is not stable. If you get a stable measuring uh, device and you put it into your socket carefully, you know what you're doing, wear rubber gloves, rubber shoes and all this. Don't do this, by the way, unless you're an expert. Don't even do what I just mentioned. Forget about it, okay? Just read up on the instability of the electricity grid. This is fine for our lights, and for our computers and for my microphone here, but it's not fine for very specific and delicate scientific instruments. You have to have a stabilizer set up before it even hits it. Anyway, that's probably more of an answer than this person wanted, but maybe they learned something from there too. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Terrific. So 
Um, the first one is, can the general underinvestment in water technology and low price of water be globally addressed through policy? Will this problem fix itself as fresh water becomes more and more scarce? Well, that's a tough one. It would depend on what part of the world you're talking about. So I guess focused on the areas that you've been addressing in your talk. Okay, uh, taking a look at Mount Kalish right there, uh, that water, some of it on one of the tributaries and streams coming from this area may end up in the Ganges and then become water in the Ganges River going past Varanasi. How do you explain to someone who believes that is holy water that you should pay more for it? How do you explain to some people in the Middle East and elsewhere who think that water is hebet Allah, it's a gift from God. Why should the government price it? Part of the problem with water waste is that in many places, the price of water is too low, but politically to increase the price of water could be explosive. A lot of this has to be dealt with through education, starting in kindergarten and preschool and middle school. How can you conserve water? Uh, think about how much water you use here when you clean the dishes. You'd be amazed at how much water you use. Uh, there's an interesting clip, if uh, the people listening in Google this. Uh, Matt Damon has an organization that he works with, water.org. And he has a video clip of uh, women collecting water in Ethiopia. Uh, sometimes the women and girls, not the guys, uh, go out for two to four to eight hours a day to collect water in these really dreadful looking plastic jerry cans uh, that are often dirty and the water is dirty. And uh, he was talking with one of the women and explained how much water the average American uses every day and it just didn't connect. Another thing for the people listening in, take a look at the water per capita use in Ethiopia versus Iceland versus the United States versus Canada. There's something called energy poverty and there are a lot of energy poor countries and actually there are energy poor people in this country where over 50% of their income goes to buying electricity for the month. And food poverty, we know about that and starvation, but water poverty is intense in many parts of the world and some parts of India, the idea of having a few gallons of water is a massive gift. It has to be a program that involves the best brains, the nicest people, because a lot of this involves moral and ethical decisions, cross-religious discussions, cross-cultural discussions, you know, the sort of stuff that the United States used to do to some degree. We can't fall into bureaucratic ways and find a solution to this. We have to not look outside of the box. We have to forget the box. Forget the box. The world is changing, it will change. We have to move on to different ways. And we have to have a striation of pricing. For the very poor people, don't increase their prices. For the richer people, the middle class, you can increase the price a bit. For the very rich, how much would it bother them to increase the price of a gallon of water by 20 cents and help preserve water? Probably not much. Many countries have done this with electricity rates. The poor have no increase, it's very low. The middle class a little bit higher, the very rich and the big users much higher. This is progressive. Progressive like progressive taxation, meaning as the percentage of income uh, the rich should pay a higher percentage. It only makes sense. And it's not a communist or Marxist idea. This is a way to keep the peace. Keep the peace. What's more important, peace? Or do you feel like uh, pure capitalism is the way to go? That ideology, frankly, is killing the world right now in many ways. I know some people in my government don't like that. That's why I put the caveat in. Next question. Thank you, Paul. Now this is our last question because we're right up at three o'clock. 
Um, so you've talked a lot about um, energy and water and food issues right uh, between countries. So do you have any examples that you might be able to give that might be interprovincial or interstate water conflicts or maybe water energy conflicts? For example, maybe like the Colorado River, which you briefly mentioned earlier. Oh, well, the LA Water District essentially stole a bunch of the water uh, from that river and up in the Sierra Nevada and is also trying to steal other water uh, based on a, a contract they made uh, with Mammoth Mountain in the Mammoth Lakes back in 1928. Uh, Los Angeles really shouldn't exist as a city. Excuse me for the students and others listening from the, it's a desert. It has really no, not enough water to keep it sustainable. And most of that stuff is piped in from elsewhere. Uh, and often that was done in an illegal and an immoral fashion. But then we have LA, right? Uh, you, you find it in many other parts of the world too. Las Vegas, my God, why does that place exist? But for the water, there used to be an ancient civilization uh, that lived in Las Vegas that disappeared, that disappeared because they ran out of water. LA and Las Vegas take their water from elsewhere. Uh, the uh, Colorado River has been in decline for a long time. Uh, interstate issues in water in this country, the, the statement in the past and actually in the present across certain states is uh, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. And yeah, read a book called Cadillac Desert. They talk about that. And by the way, I'm a non-drinker. So that I'm just quoting someone else. Uh, in uh, Kenya, there are extreme inter-tribal tensions. One of the reasons why elections in Kenya are so violent sometimes is because the, the leaders who helped bring Kenya to independence did not work as the Tanzanians did on creating a national identity. They kept the tribal identity. And it's particularly difficult when water goes across tribal lands and not just in Kenya, but throughout the world. Think of the Balkans, think of Central Asia, think of our West. It's not exactly tribal, but there are different desires and needs and wants in different groups. Again, we all have to live on this planet. We all have to live in the areas we live in. And if we can't figure out a way to live a little bit better and more peacefully, what will life be like for our grandchildren, our children, our great-grandchildren and beyond? One of the problems with this is we discount things. The water 10 years from now is not as valuable as the water of today. Just think about the following. If I gave you $10,000 right now, You'd probably be pretty happy about that. What if I told you I'm going to give you $10,000 in 100 years? You'd probably think of the risk and uncertainty. And what is $10,000 going to be like in 100 years? We don't think about our great grand grand How many in the audience think about it? You can't answer it in the chat. Maybe some of you would. How many of you think about your great 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 grandchildren and what life will be like for them? Unless we start thinking in these longer distances, and start discounting in a different way. We're gonna be using resources that should be there for the future now. They owe us. What's happening is we're taking from them. They don't owe us, we owe them, sorry. Got a correction here. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Paul. This has been an excellent talk. And I also want to thank our viewers for tuning in for our uh, afternoon or late morning if you're on the West Coast. And the one flaw of doing a webinar is we can't hear any applause. So please join me in thanking Paul for his wonderful talk in the chat box with the, either a virtual clap or a, or a thank you note. Um, he can at least see that. And, um, and I'll, before signing out, um, we'll leave a few minutes for people to say thank you. Um, yeah, there they go. <laughs> thank you very much, Paul. Well, thank you all for listening. I hope you learned something. I hope this is helpful for you and that maybe you'll start thinking about these issues for even a future career because they're gonna be here for a long, long time. All right, excellent. And as soon as we click uh, leave or sign out, um, 
the webinar will close. So thank you very much, Paul, and have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.